All right, show me you're ready to worship. Let's see some Bibles. Hold them up. Count of three, say word. One, two. One, two, three. Word. Open up to Matthew 5 today. Matthew 5. And as we turn the pages of Scripture, may we turn the attention of our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we we just come to you just in surrender and worship. We just praise you. Just ask for your blessing today. And may we receive the truth of your word into our hearts. That our lives are transformed by it. And that we live it out. And we just praise you all the more, Father. Uh, I just pray, I just pray for, for everybody here and everybody watching online and anybody and everybody, whoever will watch or listen to this, that, that we just, just are growing in our faith and our relationship with you. We're growing in spiritual maturity. And God, I just pray for this gift upon us today. Help me to preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you guys know what today it is today. Um, there's something special we do a couple times a year. And um, today is Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. Today's quiz day. Quiz day, quiz day, quiz day. We do this a couple times a year. There's uh, several statements that we like to remember together. I call them mission clarity points. So a couple times a year, I'll quiz you. And um, if you're new or newer, this is a good time to learn a little bit more about Restore. And so I've got seven questions for you today. And uh, let's, let's see how we do. So what kind of church are we? We're a church that's all about four things. Full teaching, people reaching, community building, disciple making. Those are our core values. We are all about Bible teaching, people reaching, community building, disciple making. Anything we say and everything we do is about those four core values in some way, shape, or form. And now when we come to church, we are the church. When we come to church, this is not a show or a... It's a family gathering. Ooh, good job, good job. All right. And our, one of our greatest core values is... What's this one? And discipleship, we have a special definition for it. Discipleship is not a program, it is a relationship. Okay? Now, Bible teaching, because God's Word is God's Word, we approach Scripture as a people who are Scripture-obsessed. We are obsessed with God's Word. Number five, number five, we address conflict as peacemakers. Ooh, that one wasn't good. We address conflict as peacemakers. This is a bonus question for the leaders. All the leaders in the church can add three letters, a three-letter title to their name at Restore Church. All leaders are also C chief problem solvers, CPS. You, if you're a leader at Restore, you're a CPS. You're a chief problem solver. Problems are opportunities to grow. And so we are chief problem solvers. I'm going to do those six again really fast to see how well you can do without this to help you. And then, um, and then I'm going to add a seventh one today, okay? So what kind of church are we? We're a church that's all about Amen. And at church, it's not a show or a values and discipleship is not a it's a okay. We approach scripture as people who are scripture obsessed. We approach conflict as peacemakers. And leaders, what, what do we call ourselves? We add three letters to our name. We are all what? CPS, Chief Problem Solvers. And number seven, number seven, what is something we, unique we do about four times a year? We don't do it on accident. We do it on purpose. We do reruns, reruns, reruns. Today's a rerun. If you've been here a year or longer, you've heard this message. If you've been here a year or less, you will hear it again next year. We have a couple messages we do a couple times a year. And let me give you a little background. 
First of all, there are some, there are some forms of content and, and information and data and entertainment that you watch 50 times. Some of you have watched a television series, nine seasons long, 45-minute episodes, lo long enough to have every episode memorized. But when it comes to Scripture, sometimes we read it once, we study it zero, and we never look at it again. So we believe that God's truth is God's truth, and it's even worth studying twice. So I'm going to give you a rerun of one of the messages we do every year. And uh, I, I think this one is really special because it takes about a year, and it wears off, and we need this specific reminder on a yearly basis. Today we're going to talk about dealing with conflict. We're going to talk about dealing with conflict, and let me just ask you guys on a scale of 1 to 10, in the last 30 days, how many of you had, have, have had a moment of conflict that's a 6 or higher in the last 30 days? In the last 30 days, how many people in the last 60 days have had a conflict of 6 or higher on a scale of 1 to 10? Raise your hands up, high, raise them high. Okay, let me ask one more question and then we'll get into this. How many people feel like they maybe didn't handle the level six or higher conflict righteously? It's a reminder that we need. It's a reminder that we need. And so here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to make you feel bad about your conflict. Let's just, let's just acknowledge conflict's part of life. And repeat conflicts are repeat opportunities to grow. Chances are whatever conflict you recently had, a version of it will happen again. Am I preaching to some people today? <laughs> Do you think that's the last time that you're going to experience that form of conflict? It's going to come again, so learn and let's keep going. Amen, family? All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to apply this really amazing passage. There's about 10 words in this one passage. Uh, from our Lord's teaching called the Beatitudes. And there's this one passage in Matthew 5, verse 9. Let's stand and read it together, and we're going to apply this in a laser-focused kind of way today. Laser-focused kind of way. Matthew 5, verse 9 says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Let's read that a couple more times. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. One more time. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now have a seat. And, uh, the, you know, the reality is, um, some of you guys are already thinking, like, man, conflict. My life is chaos and conflict. And some of you are thinking, I, I embrace this. I want this. I want to be more godly in conflict. And some of us are thinking, I don't want this because of I, I just I just want to do conflict the way I do it. And I want you to just get out of my business. And um, I don't care about my opinion. And quite honestly, in some regard, um, your opinion isn't very important on this matter either. We want God's perspective on this opinion. Amen, family. And so God has said, "Blessed are the peacemakers." And he says a very powerful word about peacemakers. He said, they shall be called sons of God. And the reality is, all of us are going to have conflict, probably more than likely with people closest to us. Would you agree that you're maybe more likely to have conflict with people close to you than people farther from you? Therefore, you're more likely to have repeat conflict because we're the people you spend the most time with. What did we talk about last week? Choose your six. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, and we're going to assume Christ should at least be number one over those five, and so you choose your six, right? So we're doing a mini-series on friendship next week. By the way, um, Next week, we're going to talk about King David and three friends every person should have as a continuation of last week. And I, I just, let's, let's, just, let's just go off the cuff for a minute. Um, I know somebody needs to receive this. I actually have a whole other sermon I was going to give you guys today. Um, I, was, I was up all night after the funeral just kind of trying to whip this together for you guys. And at midnight, the Lord just said, nope, you got to do the peacemaker one because somebody needs us. And next week, we're going to wrap up our, our four-week reading plan our 90-day reading plan 
with, a, with just a huge study of the whole life of King David and how friendship changed his life. Today, right in between those two studies, I know somebody here needs this. Because the conflict you have are probably with the people most important in your life, your closest friends and your most loved family members. It's inevitable. Why is it inevitable? Especially because every family has a troublemaker. And I, just, I would just caution you for a minute, if you can't think of a troublemaker in your family, it's because you're probably it. Because <laughs> you're probably it. No, but, but it makes sense that we have conflict with those closest to us, doesn't it? Because real relationships can be difficult and challenging, can't they? Real relationships. Right? In, in fact, um, one of the first things that we do, in fact, our heaviest study, if, if I do your wedding, we're going to do five or six weeks of premarital counseling, and our greatest focus is on conflict resolution. Why? Because you get married, and then you start living together, and you start to see these sides of one another that you didn't see before. And one day, you wake up, t- t- let me know if I'm preaching to some people in the house today, one day, you wake up, and you're like, man, you are kind of a beast, you're my beast, and I love you, but you are a beast nonetheless. And, and you know, every married per- person in the room is thinking, preach it, preach it, right? Because of how true that is. Why? Because real relationships can be challenging. And the closer the relationship, the more challenging it may be at times. Amen? The closer the relationship, the more challenging. In fact, let's even apply this spiritually. Sometimes our relationship with the Lord can be challenging as as we draw closer to Him, right? God loves you too much not to convict you about stuff. And sometimes you want to pull back away from the Lord rather than drawing closer to Him because sometimes there's even challenges in that relationship. Real relationships can be very challenging, especially because the closer you get to somebody... The harder it is to, remember what we talked about last week, we step into these artificial versions of ourselves when we get ready for different environments. And when you get close to somebody, they can see right through it. And you're unable unable to step into those artificial versions of yourself. So they have to, and you have to deal with the raw, real version of yourself. And to those people, God has said some really profound things. He said, blessed are the peacemakers... For they shall be called sons and children of God. Now, let's let's just clear clear the air a little bit. Does that mean close relationships are always challenging? No. They're also the most rewarding. Well, so we have to get over the bigger challenges for the greater rewards. Amen, family? And so as you get through these things, you actually just have the most intimate relationship you've ever had. In fact, I love this one of my favorite quotes ever. Uh, a wise man once said, A true friendship doesn't exist until you've had a conflict and choose to remain friends afterwards. They went on to say these words. They went on to say that um, you'll never know if they really were a friend until you had a conflict and still care about and invest in your relationship afterwards. Now, here's what that does not mean. The word of the Lord did not just tell you, because that wasn't even a scripture verse, but I'm not telling you to go pick a fight with everybody to figure out who's your real friends, okay? Uh, We don't need a brawl in the parking lot just to test the theory. Um, Are you my friend? Are you my friend? Let's fight. (laughs) I I could just see it in some of your eyes, okay? There's a lot of guys. Guys are outnumbering ladies in church today. That's a rarity. And all the fellas, there's just too much testosterone in the room, and somebody's ready to start a fight. But, but the reality is, because these things are true, right, that sometimes, rather than not having a conflict to realize the relationship's true, we become too comfortable with conflict, and we enter a cycle of conflict because we're too comfortable with conflict. Let me give you an example. Um, There's something called the crazy cycle. One of the best books you can ever read for your relationship is called Love and Respect. And there's something called the crazy cycle. And according to this study, men would rather respect. If given the choice of being loved and being respected, men would trade love for respect without a doubt on average. 
And women, women want to feel cherished. They'll feel loved by just feeling cherished and valued. And love, love over respect, hands down for women. And when a man withholds love, women withhold respect. And when women withhold respect, men withhold love. And it's just a beautiful study on this topic. And I'll be honest with you, if I can. Um, last year, Brittany and I just kind of found ourselves just kind of in a rut. And uh, we were just in this rut, and we just had to have... Can, can you turn me... Can we turn me down just a little bit? I'm just, like, echoing really bad, I think. Um, there we go. A little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. There we go. Ooh, that sounds good, doesn't it? I can yell a little bit more. Maybe up a hair. Maybe up a hair. Just a hair. A fraction of a hair. Uh, but the... Uh, I, oh, yeah. The rut. The rut. So I was just trying to avoid it. I just didn't, I just didn't want to get it out there. But the reality was... Um, um, we, we were in a rut to the extent that we had to sit down and we had to have a really serious talk about uh, where we were, not where we were at, like our marriage, uh, we weren't like on the verge of like divorce or anything, it wasn't, but we were having to acknowledge that our marriage was not headed in the godly direction that God designed it to be in. So we had to have a serious talk on like, listen, we are in a cycle, we need to break right now. And what we found out through this conversation was, um, I'm not. It doesn't. I'm gonna just blame her first. But it's a cycle, okay? So it's just easier to start with someone else. So I'm not blame. But here, here's the reality that um, she, um, I felt, was just not being very respectful to me. Okay, she was just not being very respectful to me, and um, I was responding by not being very loving to my wife. And the reality is. My wife's love language is acts of service. And so what we got into this cycle of is whenever she needed me to serve her, she'd have to make it known multiple times. And when she did, I would do it, but I would do this. Fine, I'll do it, I suppose. And I would never do it with a joyful heart. I would always do it begrudgingly with a big exasperated sigh. I would never do it on my own accord to love and value my wife. She always had to ask me. And I justified it. I was busy. I had other things to do, and I always did what needed done eventually. Key word there, right, men? Eventually, I'll get it done. It's, and because of that, um, I, I was like, listen, I, I just don't feel, feel like you're being very respectful to me. And she's, she very bluntly told me, and I needed her to say, she said, honestly, um, you're not being very respectable. And so we had to have a tough talk, and you know what we did, though? We broke the cycle. But here, here's why I'm pointing this out, is that so often, how don't we find ourselves in this cycle of, you hurt me, I hurt you, let's get over it, and just repeat the cycle, right? We just were too comfortable sometimes with conflict, and we are in this cycle of chaos and dysfunction that we become very comfortable with. This is clearly not God's desire for us. You know, we're looking at Matthew 5, 9, but you look all throughout all of the teachings of, of the Lord. Like, how valuable is peace and unity among his people on us? Amen, family? How many times does he say that? Like, like you, think about, you think about this, the one passage where he says, if you're at the temple, and remember, you're in an act of worship in God's temple, and he says, if you think about somebody that you have a quarrel with, I want, Jesus said this, he said, I want you to immediately stop your act of worship and leave the house of God, the temple, and go reconcile with the person you have conflict with. You think about how much God values reconciliation and peace in our lives. If Jesus is teaching Jewish people in the first century who are practicing worship at the temple to leave the temple to make peace. That is next level stuff, right? And, and listen, the, the way they viewed the temple was, was honestly with way higher regard of respect of worship than you and I hold regard for church. So for him to tell you that is not saying, hey, just leave a church service to do it. He's saying leave the presence of the Lord to go and do this. Are you, are you following me, family? This is how valuable he holds conflict resolution and peace in our relationships. And listen, your relationship in your household, in those closest to you, is the model for how your relationships with all other relationships will flow. Amen? It all flows out of that. And I don't know what it is for you, but I'm wondering how many of us are in that cycle right now. So maybe it is a spousal thing, like I shared. Maybe it's a parenting thing with your parents. 
Maybe it's your children. Maybe it is your closest friends who honestly, um, they're, just, they're just not treating you well, and you're just trapped in allowing them to repeat this cycle. Maybe it's that. So this is where we get to really dig into this blessing that Jesus taught us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. So there's this word, two words, in the New Testament for peace, or in the Bible for peace. One's Greek and one's Hebrew. The Greek word is called irene. The Hebrew word you've probably heard before, shalom. Turn someone next to you and say shalom. shalom. And just wish them peace, wish them peace, <laughs> wish them peace. But here's what I want you to understand. The deeper you study this, the more beautiful and the more powerful it becomes. The deeper you study this, the more wonderful and more powerful it becomes. So when you understand what Jesus was saying when he said peacemakers, okay, these wor the word for peace that Jesus used, it doesn't mean, you listen to this family, it doesn't mean I wish you the absence of war. It doesn't mean I wish you the absence of conflict. Here's what it means when Jesus said peace. He said, I wish the greatest good upon you. Right? It's not the absence of bad. It's actually the presence of the greatest good. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, he says, blessed are those not only who wish have a neutral stance towards people. He didn't just say, blessed are those who, who just don't have conflict. He's saying, blessed are those who, and this is a very active wording, who actively pursue, listen to me, who actively pursue the greatest well-being of others. Amen, family? Peace be upon you. Right? Blessed are the peacemakers. It's a very active and intentional word. And the more you study this, the more beautiful, more wonderful, and more powerful it becomes. So use that terminology for the rest of the conversation. When he says, blessed are the peacemakers, I don't want you to lack conflict. I want you to pursue the best good. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now, this is a very important uh, thing to distinguish that... Um, this kind of peace is really important, and there's a difference between what some of us would naturally do as a peacekeeper rather than a peacemaker. What's the difference, you might say? Well, this is in your notes, and I even wrote out the definitions for your benefit because you need this today. See, a peacemaker goes for peace. They work on the issues. They work through the issues. But a peacemaker, and this is probably many of us, it was me for a long, long time, peacemakers, they avoid the issues to keep the peace. Peacekeepers avoid the issues to keep the peace. Peacekeepers go around the issues so they don't have to deal with the issues. Peacekeepers sweep it under the rug. Peacekeepers sweep it under the rug. And the reality is, only so much will fit under there. Here's the reality. Eventually, the rug gets full. When you live your life sweeping everything under the rug. Can I, can I just, just kind of put it out there a little bit harder, everybody? Are you guys ready? Here's the reality. When you sweep everything under the rug... You're building a bomb. When you sweep it under the rug, you're building a bomb. And it may not even explode on the intended target. Can we be really honest? And how many of us are, are guilty of this on maybe a regular basis more than we wish were true? That you built a bomb by sweeping so many things under the rug that because that, you don't want to be a peacemaker, you want to be a peacekeeper because you don't want to deal with the discomfort of approaching and pursuing the peace. So then what happens is you swept it under the rug and there's so much under there that one, the wrong person says the wrong thing and they become the victim of all of your 
frustration, and it was the one person that deserved the least of it. So when you sweep it under the rug, you're building a bomb. And it happens, right? And it happens, and it goes off, and you're like, where did that come from? You're surprised that maybe it's your four-year-old little boy who did absolutely nothing wrong that just wanted to love you, and you explode on him, and you're like, why did I do that to my kid? The reality is, you're not dealing with your stuff. And he became a victim of your negligence. Can we just say it that way? Can we just throw it out there? And he was a victim of your negligence. Now listen, I'm not here to make you feel bad about this. Blessed are the peacemakers, and that's what we're going to be. Amen, family? Wait, wait, wait. Amen, family? Amen. Are we going to be some peacemakers? Amen. Let's do this. Let's do this. So we are peacemakers. Well, here's what a peacemaker does. A peacemaker embraces conflict. Just like our CPSs, they embrace problems because problems are opportunities to grow. We embrace the conflict and we go for it, not in the terms, not hoping to escalate it, but to de-escalate, to provide and build peace. Now make sure you're focused today because this, this is really, really powerful. So, so when we did this the first time, this was through a bigger series called, um, called I forgot what the series was called, just, it just left me, but we were talking about being, a, it was called Bless This Home, and we are talking about being a Christ-centered home. We're talking about making this shift about how we, this mind shift on how we think about everything, that we're not just Christians, we're not just Sunday sit our butts in church Christians, right? We're actually Christ-centered in all that we do, in all that we think, in all that we are, and we want to sh- have that shift in our mind that that's how we view our whole life. And so when we look at conflict, we don't, we don't embrace it in, in a, an aggressive, let's provoke the bear kind of way. We're, we're embracing it. We're embracing it from the standpoint of this is godliness, right? This is godliness to pursue the conflict in the pursuit of the greater pursuit, which is peace. We're peacemakers, right? And so, so let's be honest, right? In, in our, our on-Christ-centered mindset, we view conflict sometimes like this. Can we just, let's just be, throw all the cards on the table, Somebody does some wrong to us, no matter how close they are, and sometimes our response to the conflict is two very powerful and profound words, screw them. (laughs) Until enough time has passed, and we can pretend that it was swept under the rug and live life until the next screw you moment occurs. That's not Christ-centered. That's not, that's not in here. That's not it. Christ-centered living would say, what does Jesus teach about how to handle this situation? Or just go back to the 90s and look at your little wristband that says, what would Jesus do? Romans 12, 17 through 21 says this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful, listen to this, man, this is so good. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Listen to the word of God, man. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil with good. So here's what we're going to do. How do we do this? How do we do this? How do we be this peacemaker? I'm going to give you three traits of a peacemaker lifestyle. Okay, Number one is peacemakers speak truth and love. Right? Peacemakers speak truth and love. This is right out of Ephesians 4.15. We will speak truth and love growing in every way more and more like Christ. Speak truth in love. How are we peacemakers? How are we Christ-centered? We speak truth in love. And listen, you don't yell truth in love, right? You don't yell truth in love. Hey, you messed me, you messed up, and I'm really mad at you. You suck. You don't yell truth in love. By the way, that last part wasn't loving, was it? You don't yell truth in love. 
Why did you keep leaving your shoes on the middle of the floor? How many times have I told you to put your shoes away? And while you're, you know, you're getting yelled at for leaving your shoes out in the middle of the floor, you, and you just say, by the way, I hit your car when I parked in the garage, and there's a shoe flying in your face because you were, speak, you were yelling truth and love and instead of speaking truth and love. What do we do? We speak truth and love. And let me, let me add to this, okay? During non-conflict times. Right? During non-conflict times. During non-conflict times. How often do we do it in the heat of a moment and all we do is we add fuel to the fire because we didn't let anything simmer down well enough to have true resolution. We speak truth and love during non-conflict times. Um, I'll use Kyle as an example because I know I, Kyle let me pick on him without getting mad. Uh, Kyle is one of my dearest friends, worship leader Kyle over there. And uh, when there's, if there's two people who are going to have a conflict, you and I are two of the most likely people to butt heads because we both like to call the shots on things. And um, we, we butt heads probably more often than some other people in the church. But because of that, um, we also have one of the strongest friendships because we've overcome many conflicts together. And we've, we've always made a commitment to speak truth and love and overcome. And Kyle did a really good job of that. Just a couple weeks ago, we were at a meeting, and Kyle was really upset, and, and he was in the right, and I was in the wrong. I kind of bulldozed Kyle at a meeting. And um, he, that's good. He doesn't even remember what I'm talking about. That's good. That's good. He's like, he's like what did Jeff do to me? Um, <clears throat> But I, I kind of wronged him at a meeting. I bulldozed him at the meeting, and he could have just exploded, spoke tr- tr- yelled truth in hate at the meeting, and disrespected me during the meeting, and we could have had a conflict. But afterwards, he, he held on to his conflict. He spoke truth in love, and I apologized. And um, we, we made, made sure that that's not going to be a repeat situation. We did during a non-conflict time. And we do know that if Kyle and I spoke conflict during a conflict time, it would be a longer resolution. It would be a longer resolution. Right? We speak truth in love. We speak truth in love. We speak truth in love. We do it during non-conflict times. Number two, peacemakers apologize when they're wrong. They apologize when they're wrong. Now, this is an act of humility. And there's a beatitude all about the people who are humble in spirit. There's a blessing for those who are humble in spirit. And James 5.16 says what? We, We even studied this last week. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. We give everything to God, but there's also a healing in confessing to each other. I want you to think about this for a minute, because I just want you to—I just want us to acknowledge what would our some of our relationships look like if we just apologize when we're wrong. Are you with me, family? What if we just apologize? I was wrong. Period. Not but, I was wrong. Period. I'm sorry. But, are, are, are you tracking me? I was wrong. And, and, and here, here's, here's, here's one of my favorite examples ever. This is not an apology, and this is what we do sometimes, right? Stomp, 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 stomp. I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, you big, dumb, stupid baby. You know, that's, that's not an apology. But isn't that sometimes our apology? No, we apologize when we're wrong. And let me, let me teach you something really powerful, okay? We, we shoot for repentance rather than remorse. Right? We shoot for repentance rather than remorse. Let me, let me show you the difference. Okay? Um, remorse is, um, I'm sorry I got caught. Remorse is, I'm sorry that we're in this comfortable, uncomfortable situation that we have to deal with. Right? I'm sorry that, um, you know, whatever you can say so that there's a but and you're not fully responsible for the situation at hand. That's remorse. Repentance was, I sinned against you. That's on me. And I am truly sorry. 
Repentance is, I understand what I did was wrong, and I'm changing my mind about that. Repentance is, I am responsible for me, and this is not your fault. I am truly sorry. Will you forgive me? Remorse. Sorry, repentance rather than remorse. Is this, is this hitting home a little bit, family? Or are, we, are, we, are, we, are we getting this? Let's be peacemakers. So what do we do? We speak truth and love. We apologize when we're wrong. And the third one, peacemakers, forgive and let go. Don't forgive and lock it away forever and hang on to it for a really long time and rub your nose in it every chance you get and detonate that bomb on repeat. Can we be honest? What some of us do in terms of forgiveness is, is we purposely build bombs and we put people in situations where it will explode in their pay, face just so we can make them acknowledge the wrong that they put against us on repeat. We forgive and let go. Here's what I know about some of you. Some of you have experienced things where you're saying, I know you're telling me to forgive, but you don't know what I've been through. If somebody did to you what somebody did to me, you wouldn't be asking me what you're asking me. Can, can, I just, can, I just, can we just talk about that real quick? I don't know what all of you have been through, but I do understand. Can I, let me say that again. I, I don't know what you've been through, but I do understand when my uh, four-year-old was born, we were in the hospital, and I, I, I said something by mistake to offend my nurse. She, she thought I was insulting her ability to care for my child, and because uh, I, I, I don't know how it came up, but I was just talking about whether she had kids or not, and she felt like I was, I was judging her for trying to take care of my kid without having any kids of her own, and I felt so bad. I had meant no offense to her, but she, she said something um, in a very lovingly way. And loving way, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, you got to remember this. Uh, a heart surgeon doesn't need to have heart surgery in order to save your life. Just because I don't have a kid doesn't mean I'm not an expert at taking care of your newborn baby. There are some ways right now that I'm loving your baby more than you are because I understand your baby's needs more than you do, perhaps. So let me tell you, family, I don't know what you've been through, but I do understand more than I understand, the Lord Almighty does. And so you say, how can I forgive him? Well, let me, let me give you a couple words of advice. Number one, it's been said that unforgiveness is the poison that we drink expecting others to suffer. So number one, don't let someone else control you in that greatly, right? Because when you're withholding forgiveness from people who deserve it, you know what you're doing? You're giving them control of your emotions, if somebody doesn't deserve your forgiveness and you refuse to give it until they meet your criteria of X, Y, or Z, if you say, I won't forgive them until they do this, then their actions control your heart. Are you with me, family? Don't let them control you like that. That's number one. But number two, you say, how do I forgive because the offense is so great? Well, let's just look at what God's Word says. Colossians 3.13 says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against one another... Just as the Lord has forgiven you, also forgive. Amen? So how do you forgive the greatest offense that is not deserved? The same way God forgave your greatest offense that was not deserved, being of forgiveness. How do we forgive? Just as Christ forgave us. So what are we going to do? We're going to be peacemakers. Not peace fakers. Not peacekeepers. And let's be honest, sometimes we're just peace takers. Some of us, we just live with such an aggressive, uh, offensive personality that we just go around and we just take peace. No, we're going to go through and go work on conflicts because we are peacemakers. And God said what? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. How do we do it? We're going to speak truth and love during non-conflict times. What are we going to do? We're going to apologize when we're wrong. 
What are we going to do? We're going to forgive and let go. And how do we do this? Just as Christ did for us. Right now, how many of you, I'm going to ask count to three, and I'm going to just have you raise your hand. How many of you, on the count of three, have something that you need to forgive and let go? One, two, three. Let me pray over you. Father God, I, I pray. I pray for everybody in this room with their hands raised. Keep your hands up. Keep them high. God, I pray just forgiveness, that you just you put forgiveness in these people's hearts. That right now, Lord, you just, you just remove the bitterness and the anger and the frustration. God, I pray right now over them that, that they can also receive forgiveness if they've never received it and they never allowed themselves to, Father. I just pray this healing over our faith family right here. May this be a moment, a defining moment in everybody's lives that we are healed of our unforgiveness and that we grow in our ability to forgive. And God, we can forgive just as we said because you first forgave us. So anybody here, Lord, who's never received the gift of forgiveness from you, I pray right now that in their hearts they just cry out to you their own version of these words. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. I don't deserve your forgiveness, but you are a God of grace and mercy and you have offered forgiveness to me. So right now in my heart and in my faith that that you've given me right now, I give my whole life to you in surrender. I receive your forgiveness and I live for you now and forever. And I'm going to make myself known so my faith family can celebrate this. And we know that right now the kingdom of heaven is celebrating all of the things happening in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody hold your hands up and let's give the Lord a round of applause. There's some forgiveness happening today. Amen, amen. Let's stand up and worship.